Hello everyone, welcome to Teacher Development Webinars. My name is Amanullah Sand. I facilitate virtual programs at Teacher Development Webinars. I welcome you all at Teacher Development Webinars. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Teacher Development Webinars is a social action project to support teachers and educators around the world with professional development opportunities. It is an initiative using the rise in online professional development to connect people from around the world with opportunities which they will not have had due to the old normal of face-to-face -face conferences. We are thankful to Master English Training for sponsoring a Zoom account. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Luis Jeva Penton Herrera. Dr. Luis Jeva Penton Herrera, PhD, served as the 30th president of Maryland T. Soul in 2018 to 2019. He currently serves as assistant professor at the University of Vasa in Poland and as coordinator for the TESOL certificate and adjacent professor at the, at the George Washington University, USA. In addition, he serves as the social responsibility intersection co-chair at TESOL International Association. Dr. Penta Herrera's current research projects include exploring the language and literacy, experiences of adults and, and adult indigenous students from Latin America, exploring adults and, and adult students with limited or interrupted formal education, social emotional learning and well-being in language and literacy education, and auto ethnography and storytelling. He is the co-editor with Ethan Tin of Critical Storytelling Multilingual Immigrants in the United States, the editor of English and students with limited are interrupted formal education, global perspectives on teacher preparation and classroom practices, co-author of a social emotional learning in English language classroom, self-care and independence, fostering growth, self-care. Okay, this is uh, our social emotional learning in English language classroom, fostering growth, self-care and in, in independence published by TESOL Press and co-author of the Maryland, Maryland TESOL Handbook for Educators of English Learners. To learn more about Dr. Herrera, please visit his website, lewispenton.com. What a player it is to have you at Teacher Development Webinars. And Dr. Lewis, welcome to Teacher Development Webinars. Thank you very much. And um, thank you very much, Amanula. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen. Um, one second, please. All right, can everybody see my screen? Yep. Wonderful. And I think we have a little bit of a delay, so I'll be mindful of that. So, um, you know, in the communication, there is a delay. I think there is a delay for the, for the slides as well. We, we have, um, I'm seeing here in the chat box, uh, people from all over the world. I'm joining from Poland. Um, we have people in Pakistan, China, Myanmar, Philippines. Wonderful. Uh, Turkey, Austria, Indonesia, Iran. Thank you all for joining us so much. So I'll be very aware of the uh, perhaps the, the, the small delay that we, we have. Okay. So again, my name is Luis. Thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, today I'll be talking about emotions matter, learner psychology, and social emotional learning. And of course, my gratitude to Mr. Amanula for the kind invitation. And again, thank you all for joining us. So today, the agenda for today, I want to talk a little bit about, um, I'm going to divide the, the conversation into three parts. So the first part is background of second language acquisition. Learners, the second part is learner psychology and second language acquisition. Then uh, we're going to talk about building positive experiences, and I'm going to be focusing specifically on social emotional learning in second language. Okay, so um, the first part, which is the background of second language acquisition, and I'm going to be, if it's okay with all of you, I want this, session, I want to for you to be involved. So I'll be asking some questions during the, the conversation um, to see if, 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 you know, if you would like to share in the chat box, I would definitely invite you. Okay, so I don't want this to be a lecture, but more of a conversation. 
So questions, second language acquisition, six to answer. So um, just a, a brief overview here to kind of provide a foundation for acquisition is commonly used in the field to refer to the problem a language. And I'm wondering, um, I would love to hear from you when you think about questions that SLA seeks to answer, um, do you have any thoughts or any ideas on what would be some potential questions if, if I may have a all of you uh, write a question in the chat box, like for example, in your, in your context, what will be a question that second language acquisition would um, seek to answer in your specific context? I would love to hear from you. So if I can give you a, a few seconds there so you can type and then I'll share some questions with you as well. But um, I would love to hear from you how to improve pronunciation. Yes, oops, this is, I guess, automatic and it's starting to show the question. Sorry about that. Um, okay, let me go back. Sorry about that. How to improve pronunciation. Thank you very much. Nasila, I see here, pronunciation is important. Anybody else, any other thoughts, any questions that second language acquisition might be interested in, in answering or, or exploring in your translation important. Thank you very much, Eva. How, uh, how should future translators, interpreters study languages? Fabulous. Yes. And I think in translation interpretation is not very much uh, present in SLA. It should become more prevalent. Effective factors. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, could strengthen SLA of learners. Thank you, Mark. Um, how to remember the new words while talking, Nasila. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Okay, so let me share with you some questions here and please continue to, to write some questions there. Thank you all very much. So three questions that, um, and there of course many, many more, depends on the context, depends on, your, on the interest. Uh, some potential questions, three questions here is that we might explore in SLA, for example, how does the language learner come to know? How do they know, you know, how do we as second language, second language learners, how do we know a language? How do we come to know the language? Um, how, how does the language learner acquire this knowledge? Okay, and then of course it's involved in their like grammar rules that I'm, I'm seeing here. Yin, thank you very much for, for that. The grammar rules, uh, pronunciation, all of these things. And then last but not least, a uh, third potential question here. What are some language, uh, what, what are, why, I'm sorry, why are some language learners more successful than others? And in this particular question, the third question, I am very, very interested uh, from the perspective of, of the affective concern, right? So when we think about motivation, anxiety, emotions, and this is something that, um, in my experience, uh, emotions and, and well-being is not as prevalent in teaching training as, uh, for example, uh, skills like uh, teaching, um, sorry, I don't know why it seems this is uh, very, okay, let me go back here. Uh, emotions are not as prevalent or, or visible in teacher preparation as they are, uh, for example, teaching about grammar, teaching about and, and those things are important, of course, but when we think about affected concerns, you know, why are some success, uh, le language learners more successful than others, then we think about, you know, if you're anxious in the classroom, can you really learn? If you're, uh, when we think about well-being, if students are housing insecure, they don't have house, they don't have um, food when they go back home, you know, they don't have a successful uh, long rest, eight, eight hours of sleeping when they go back to school, you know, are they able to be successful language learners? Those are the things that I'm, I'm very concerned about and very interested in continuing to research. And that's kind of our, uh, where we're going with our presentation today, this with this conversation, the affective concerns, okay? In second language acquisition, we have to be mindful that um, second language acquisition is kind of a, a a mix, right? It, it draws from different uh, multiple disciplines. So we have linguistics, so, uh, sociology, uh, we have absolutely psychology there uh, with uh, well-being, second language acquisition, um, well-being and, and social emotional learning. There is also a, a with positive psychology. Um, with the work of, of uh, Tammy Gregerson, for example, Sarah Mercer, they're doing fabulous work with uh, positive, um, positive psychology and well-being. So let me continue here. And then just a quick overview here for um, second language acquisition through time. And again, this is kind of like a foundation so we can continue conversation. But um, in the 40s and 50s, 
um, second language acquisition, how it has evolved, right? As you can see here, but 40s and 50s, it was very influenced by um, the work of Skinner, for example, empirical paradigm and uh, behaviorism, this idea that uh, everything could be, um, you know, behaviors could be taught, right? But then it trans uh, move, right? move gravitated towards the 60s and 70s towards the cognitive paradigm with the work of Chomsky and um, there was this idea that as human beings were uh, in native uh, in natively we're, we're programmed to just learn and acquire languages right and um, that's where where the work in the 60s and 70s started to to move towards um, and with the work of the universe as human beings language because we're humans and this, that was kind of like the you know we have this uh device in our uh brains that allows us to learn languages of course there has been some debate about that i'm sorry i don't know why this keeps moving let me go back here and then towards the 80 80s um, i'm sorry the social cultural paradigm this is kind of where we are um with the work of Bakhtin and vygotsky and construct and um we, we started thinking more about uh, second language acquisition, the process of language learning from the perspective of, of social uh, constructs, right? So like, for example, um, language learning is a, is a social uh, social uh, endeavor, right? So we learn in community, we learn with individuals. And um, with this constructivist uh, perspective, um, there are two emphases that, uh, I mean, at least for me, have, have become very important in, in recent years and, and very prevalent in research as well, which is effective concerns. And quite honestly, I don't think effective concerns have been explored enough. Concerns, emotions, and, and all of these things. Um, the, you know, mo most of the, the research that has been conducted has been conducted from the pur purview of um, negative how anxiety affects language learner, uh, how um, like anxiety or, or stress or all of these uh, emotions that perhaps are undesired emotions. But, um, you know, but like I said, there is a psychology and how we met my approach, uh, emotions and well-being in language learning, the work of, again, Tommy Gregerson, Sarah Mercer, there, there are many more uh, other more that, that are they're doing great work with this. But um, so affective concerns is, is very important and how we might use positive, um, affective um, tools like, you know, motivation use in the classroom. But then also um, identity, like language acquisition as a social process, and especially the, the work of identity has become very prevalent lately. And, um, you know, how do we use identity or how does identity um, kind of... Uh, um, becomes part of, of language learning and how it situates itself in language learning. And identities is rarely explored in teacher preparation programs, but it, it also it has a dual effect, not only for teacher identity, but how do students see themselves as language learners in the classroom? Um, that affects identity for sure. Um, and that's a, that affects um, language learning in general, okay? So going into the learner psychology, which is part two of our presentation, we're kind of, this foundation, I'm gonna put it now into uh, a better perspective here in part two. And if you have any questions as I'm speaking, please write in the chat box. I'm, um, if I'm going too fast, I know again, we have a delay, please let me know, okay? So I can slow down a little bit. So um, learner psychology in second language acquisition. So I would like to share with you um, that um, this is actually um, an excerpt, a paragraph from a chapter that I wrote in, in this book, Critical Storytelling, that I had the pleasure of um, editing with Ethan, my, my co-editor. But um, I, I talked a little bit about my experience, and I always say that I had a very difficult time learning English. I, I, I moved to the United States, and I moved, I was 16, almost 17. And for me, learning English was very, very difficult. And then now that I'm returning back to my experiences and trying to, to explore why it took me so long to learn English, I realized that a lot of it had to do with emotions and, and the, the experiences that I, I was having, the events, the, the negative events that, that I was experiencing during my language learning. 
to this paragraph. Evelyn, a classmate, and I were practicing in English the new vocabulary words we had just learned while Mrs. R, our English as a second language teacher, talked to a colleague. Mrs. R stopped talking to her colleague and yelled at Evelyn and me. What are you two doing? Miss, we're practicing English. I shyly respond, or I shyly reply while Evelyn proudly. Mrs. R laughed out loud in front of the class and exclaimed, yeah, right, giving us a contemptuous look. My heart sank in uneasiness and disappointment. Evelyn's smile withdrew for the remainder of the class uh, for the for the remainder of the school year at Mrs. R's class. And uh, this is actually a real event that happened to me in high school. And I was very motivated to, um, you know, learn English. And, and I was a, what I called a, a very good, responsible student. But then I continued to have events like this where I try to practice and I was very involved with my classmates. And um, I continue to have negative experiences in my, in my classrooms with uh, teachers who didn't believe that I was actually just, you know, if like, for example, Mrs. Hart thought that I was just talking to Evelyn when I was actually trying to practice. But then this event affected both of us, Evelyn and I, not only in our relationship to our teacher, but also in how we started, um, you know, feeling um, every time we went to the classroom, to the English classroom. And that, of course, not only affected our emotions, but our performance in school, for example, but also in, in learning English in general. So when we think about emotions and, um, you know, what, what events, what experiences are affecting your students' um, language learning? And that, that's a question that I think we don't ask enough. And that's something to, to definitely con be concerned about and in, in, in considering your teaching. So I would like to um, ask all of you, have you had similar experiences or have you seen something like this with your students or perhaps your, your um, student teachers, if you're teaching teachers, um, have you had similar experiences with language learning where one event or a series of events has perhaps affected your participation, your engagement with um, language learning? So let me give you a few seconds here if you can write in the chat box. Okay, thank you all for um, everything that you're all writing here in the chat box. If everyone would like, if anyone would like to share there in the chat box, if you if you have seen or if you had experienced how the the negative effects of um, emotions or how emotions have had negative effects on second language acquisition. And I'm seeing here. Thank you all for everything um, that you're writing here. That's wonderful. Okay, so I'll continue here for now. I know some of you are, are writing, so I'll circle back. Uh, but thank you for, yes, for uh, my Chinese students, their body language can be interpreted, yes, differently. Yes, Mark, thank you very much for that. And that's actually, um, we have had um, some stories about that, unfortunately, uh, about English learners who um, their, their body language might be interpreted differently depending on the culture that they come from. Yes, and like, for example, in the United States, um, uh, like paying uh, close attention to the teacher and having making eye contact is very important. But then in other cultures, making eye contact with teachers is disrespectful. And that has definitely been um, um, a cultural misunderstanding in many classrooms. Um, when learning French, being told that my pronunciation in Italian was horrible. I'm so sorry about that, Eva. Yes, so those things, you know, those events, they definitely leave something inside uh, as learners inside of you. And then you start developing or learners start developing a relationship with that language and, and the speakers of that language and that affects language acquisition. So when we think about, uh, thank you all again for sharing. Uh, when we think about learner psychology, what is it? Well, um, in, when we think about learning psychology in second language acquisition, we must acknowledge that all students are different, which requires that we teach them differently. We also, going back to what, for example, Mark was saying about um, cultural differences, okay? Not only different in how we learn and uh, able, how we're, we're able to do some things or not, uh, keeping in mind like disabilities and, and you know, all, but there are other factors like 
cultural factors and uh, native languages that the students might bring with them that um, depending of course on your native language, there might be some um, transference to the new language or not. So all of these things we have to, to think about when we're thinking about learning psychology. Uh, number two, historically academic environments around the world have emphasized academic achievement uses standardized testing, which in most cases People might be raising their eyebrows like, what? <laughs> you know, uh, standardized testing, uh, in my experience, um, it, you know, it, it's a, a little problematic for, uh, at least in the, in the settings that I have worked at, and um, do not always benefit the students. Um, learners are human beings with individual dif differences and effective necessities that are rarely met in academic environments. And this is, um, you know, this perspective of educating the whole child. We're just in many, many academic environments when we think about language learning, especially in K through 12, uh, but I've, I've also certainly seen this in adult education environments. We focus on, yes, print literacy, speaking and listening, but what about educating the, the language learner into the new cultural environment? You know, if, if you're learning a language, and again, going back to that idea earlier in the presentation, that language is, is a social, social construct, construct, I'm sorry. So that means that um, we learn languages as social beings, you know, in, in interactions with other members, other social, um, uh, you know, groups. So, um, if you're just learning the language, how are we using it correctly? Like for example, some phrases might be appropriate in specific settings, but not in others. Or if there are other, other countries that speak the same language, perhaps one word might be okay for this country, but not for that country, you know? So those are our um, nuances that we have to teach our students. And the way that we do that is um, definitely thinking about, okay, how do we not only teach reading and writing and speaking and listening, but affective necessities. You know, how do, do they deal with, um, for example, misunderstandings and how do they deal with, um, perhaps they, they bring a different cultural uh, background and in, in the new environment where they're going to be immersed linguistically, they have to um, express themselves differently. Thinking about, for example, body language. Um, you know, so those are things that, uh, they're not always taught or addressed in language classrooms that I think is important for us to consider. So um, some individual differences, and this is from the work of Dernay, by the way, um, I have the reference at the end, but some individual differences and effective concerns that we have to take into consideration here when teaching second language acquisition to your learners. And also for us, if we're second language learners ourselves, or we're learning new languages. And when we say second language learners, it's just learning new languages. It could be third, fourth, fifth, you know. Uh, personality, are students introvert or extroverts, for example? This is very important. And I, I noticed this when I'm teaching um, my student teachers. Uh, we do activities where they actually get to evaluate themselves as language learners. And they, they start realizing how their personality affects not only their participation in class as well. We all have students, and um, I know many of my students come to mind who are very extrovert. And then in the class, they tend to dominate the class um, you know, activities. And when you ask questions, they tend to raise their hand and they always want to say things out loud. And even sometimes you're not even calling their names and they're like, you're, you're just yelling out, out loud the, the, the answers. So personality is very important. It also helps you balance a little bit the, the classroom dynamics, okay? So um, introverts sadly tend to fade in the background, especially if you have a big class. Like for example, sometimes I taught classes of 30 or 40 students. You know, I'm only one, so I, I do my best to balance everything, but sadly introverts or more choir students tend to kind of fade in the background. Language aptitude, natural ability of learners. Some students, for example, arrive in our classrooms and they have already um, acquired two, three languages and they're just, you know, they have this natural ability of learning languages and they're multilingual already. So chances are those language aptitudes are going to help them or, or going to support their language learning of just the way it works. The more languages you know, the more linguistic knowledge you have in your linguistic repertoire, the easier it's going to be for you to make connections to new languages. 
And we have to be aware of this. This is why it's important for us to know our students' backgrounds and what languages they know. And by the way, some of the languages that they know might be indigenous languages that many times are uh, neglected or not thought about as, as languages. So as teachers, we have to be very aware of this and we have to ask them, what languages do you speak, including indigenous languages, of course. Um, in my experience, many students sometimes um, kind of forget about indigenous languages and they just think about other oh, more, um, perhaps more prevalent languages or more known languages, which uh, should not be the case. Motivation, interest. And this is very, very important, both intrinsic and extrinsic um, motivation. And in my experience, motivation plays or interest plays a key role in language learning. I have had students and you know, I don't know if, if it's the case with some of you, some students just had to take, for example, if I was teaching English as a second language or Spanish, and then they would say, I just have to take this class to pass and graduate. So it's kind of like a check, you know, so they're not very interested or motivated to learn the language. They're just there to learn and um, they do enough just to pass, but um, that definitely um they, they approach language learning. There are older students who are very motivated to learn the language for whatever reason, like for example, adults, uh, adult learners tend to be very motivated because they're, they're pursuing language learning to apply, usually to apply that knowledge in real life settings, um, it, it, whether it's you know, their new job, they're migrating, whatever the case, new opportunities in a new environment. So they're very, very motivated to learn. And that definitely boosts their um, not only their performance, but their achievement as well. Learning styles, when we think about multiple intelligences, um, this is very important for us as teachers because when we think about learning styles, um, we tend to teach in the way that we're more comfortable learning. And I know I, you know, I'm, I'm guilty of that as well. It's just the way it is, right? So um, we feel more comfortable learning in a specific way or, or learning style, or multiple, you know, the way that we we feel we're more intelligent and more comfortable learning. And that's the way that we tend to teach. But we also have to be aware of our students' learning styles because many times if we keep using the same strategies and the same um, you know, teaching styles, then we might not be reaching those students who learn differently, right? Had, just to give you an example, when I was teaching uh, 12th grade, I had students who were um, in, in um, their, their learning style was more like nature learning style. They had to be surrounded by nature, outside in nature. So what I did was I started going outside the classroom. Thankfully, we were uh, we had some green space outside so I could just go outside the building and, you know, we could just sit there and, and learn every now and then, depending on the weather. Sometimes the weather was not very good. So, um, you know, kind of changing it up a little bit to also give them that opportunity. Um, emotions, what and how students are feeling. And this is very important for me, emotions and, and well-being. When we think about the emotions in our, probably in our teacher preparation, the most that we have heard about emotions was lowering the affective filter, which is, you know, lowering anxiety, lowering stress, so students can participate. Yes, yes. But there's so much more than that. When we think about emotions, um, you know, not only uh, like teachers, for example, we have our own emotions. How are we regulating our, regulating our own emotions, but also our students? How are students regulating their own emotions? And I had students, just to give you a quick example here, I had students who had already um, this defeatist um, mindset and this emotion of I'm not good enough. I'm not going to be able to make it. And um, they would tell me, they would vocalize that and they would say, you know, Mr. Penton, I'm, I'm not good at this. I'm, I'm not going to be able to learn this. I'm like, no, no, we have to change that. We have to, you, you are good. You can do this. You just need practice. And then, you know, we have to help our students understand that their emotions, they do become the way that we feel and the things that we externalize, they do become our mindset. So if our students are already coming to our classrooms thinking, I'm not good at this, I'm not going to learn this, I cannot do it, that's going to become their mindset and that's, it's just going to become the reality. So we just have to help them and that takes us into emotional intelligence. That takes, uh, you know, um, the, the next one, number six, we have to help them regulate those emotions and, and frame it in a different way. And the way that I, I would do that, for example, when I was teaching my students is that I would tell them stories of how um, I, for example, when I was learning languages and when I was teaching ESO, for example, how uh, when I was learning uh, as, a, as a language learner as well, how I made many mistakes. 
and how I, um, you know, some of the events that I experienced were not uh, the best. You know, we always make mistakes. There were always misunderstandings. You always say the wrong word or the wrong pronunciation. And that causes, um, you know, hopefully good memories that everybody can laugh about afterwards. But it's good for them to know that, you know what, it happened to me as well. And uh, it's okay. It happens to all of us. We're language learners. But you learn. And look, it happened to me. I'm, I'm teaching you now because I learned so you can learn as well. You know, so it's very important to keep in mind our students' individual differences. And, and as teachers, it, it's, it's also important not only when we think about our, our, our individuals' differences of our students, but also our own individual differences and in how some of them might be compatible or not with our students. Like, for example, um, I tend to be more of an introvert. My students who are very extroverts, they, they take my attention right away because, again, I'm, I'm more of an introvert, but then I have to be mindful. OK, so I, I do have also students who are very introverted. So how am I reaching them? You know, and also thinking of myself as a learner, I'm, I'm more of an introvert. Many times when I'm learning a new language or in the classroom, many of my teachers tend to choose a more extrovert learner. So we always all of those funds of knowledge that we bring all of our experiences as language learners. We also bring that into the class. Use that as your uh, to your advantage as well. OK, so let's go into the third um, the third part here of our conversation. And if we have any questions, please write it in the chat box. And I see here that um, uh, we have a lot of conversation. Thank you all very much uh, for, for your conversation. I'll definitely circle back here. We must be. Thank you, for uh, Fernando. Let me see here. Um, yes, um, this is not easy, but it's important. We need to be aware of this. Yes. Thank you very much for. We also have to um, dealing with emotions is a two we have to understand our students emotions and many times the ways that uh, our students respond to to learning in our classroom dealing with that they're experiencing how do we receive those emotions and again as Fernando is saying here make sure that we don't mix you know um, or let our personal lives interfere with our teaching, the emotions that we might experience in outside of the classroom, they shouldn't become part of, of, of the classroom experience. So that is very important to, to keep in mind. It, 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 teachers, we have to be very, very emotionally, uh, emotionally intelligent because we have to be able to not only understand what we're feeling, but also regulate our, our own emotions in the classrooms, which is sometimes are positive, but sometimes are uh, emotions that we don't want to experience. And um, teachers' emotions also matter. Absolutely, Saim, absolutely. Thank you very much for that, absolutely. So let me get us here into the third part of our conversation and hopefully, and I'll be glad to share all these links with all of you. You can read all of these articles. If um, if if for some reason you, you articles or the links, uh, please email me and I'll give you my email at the end and I'll be glad to share all with you, okay? Um, yeah, so great question here. So let's go um, learner psychology, and then we go into part three. Some students never intend to learn. How should we, should teachers, how should we teachers deal with them? Thank you, Saima, for that question. And this goes back to what I was saying about motivation and interest. And there are some students that they just need, um, they just need a check, you know, to, to um, you're very welcome, Yin. For, uh, I'll, glad to, I'll be glad to share the resources. So oh, some students just go into our classrooms because they need to pass the class to graduate. And as long as the only thing that we can control is their experiences in our classroom, we teach the best we can. I've had some students, Saima, that uh, it's same, same. You know, they, they just need to be in my classroom to graduate and that's it. And they're not interested in learning the language, but they have to have a language course. Um, I still teach them to the best of my ability, but I know the motivation is just to pass, not to learn the language. And that that's not something that I can control. So uh, talking about teacher self-regulation, we have to regulate because intrinsically we want to teach languages and that's, we're passionate about the languages that we're teaching. So we want all of our students to learn the languages, but if, if they're not willing, it, you know, it's, it's 50, 50 teachers teach the best of their ability, but students have to also be willing to learn. We cannot, it doesn't work. I hope that that's a, um, an answer that uh, makes sense. So let's go into uh, part three. 
building positive experiences, you're very welcome. Um, so again, I'm, I'm going into the topic of social emotional learning here, which I found to be very, very helpful for my students. And if you're not familiar, let me share with you a just quick overview here of um, social emotional learning. It's the process through which all young people and adults acquire skills and attitudes to develop healthy identities, manage emotions, and achieve personal and collective goals. Feel and show empathy for others, and empathy is very important. Establish and maintain supportive relationships and make responsible decisions, respons uh, responsible and caring decisions, I'm sorry. So um, when I was talking to uh, um, a veteran colleague of mine, kind of uh, trying to introduce this topic of uh, social emotional learning to my colleague, my colleague said, you know what, this is just what teaching was supposed to be back in my day. And it makes sense, you know, teaching social emotional learning is just teaching with heart, making sure that we care for students, the whole student, not just teaching, reading, writing, listening, speaking. No, it's, it's language learning and just teaching in general is much more than that. Students are human beings, right? And that's what, what we should care about, not only the four language domains, but the student as a person as well, and their success as a human being. So I'm going to share with you here a little bit of Castles, um, which is one of the most recognized frameworks, but I, I do have other activities and examples that I can share with you um, as we continue. But one of the most uh, recognized frameworks for social emotional learning is Castles competencies, which focuses on self-awareness, awareness, responsible uh, relationship skills, I'm sorry, and responsible decision-making. So for the first one, um, we have a great question here. Rukaya, I hope I'm pronouncing your name uh, correct. Is social emotional learning a conscious process? Can a teacher train and help learner to control emotions without the learner knowing it? Um, in my experience, it, it has to be a, a process that is involved, that the students understand what they're, they're doing, that they're involved in the process. And it, it's difficult at first. I'm going to go through some activities now, but it's, it's difficult at first because Schools have tended to just focus on academics and not on, on, on teaching and feeding the, the person, right? Our, 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 our social emotional um, intelligence as well. So I'll, I'll share some emotions or uh, some examples of how we could um, introduce emotions in the classroom. So self-awareness, um, the ability to understand one's emotions, this is very, very important. And in, um, I'm doing a lot of work now with teacher um, student teachers. So they're in service or pre service student teachers. And a lot of the activities that I'm doing in our classroom, because the, the assignments for, for the teacher preparation programs, they used to focus on, on students, you know, teachers going into the classroom and observing students and writing reports. And that was not working for me because I wanted them to understand first themselves as teachers, and many of my teachers as well, they're going to teach a language, but they don't speak a second language. So, so they're teaching second language learners, but they're, they don't speak a second language. So they have never experienced what their students are going to experience. So I've been in, feel the same, um, the same experiences, right? They're learning a new language and all of these things. Uh, it, it's, it's a different kind of a different conversation, but, you know, self-awareness, I'm, I'm becoming more and more interested in, in teachers, uh, specifically in preparation of their own emotions when they're learning a new language, so they can feel empathy, they can see what their students go through, right? And even for language learners who may have learned a second language or bilingual, multilingual individuals who learn languages long time ago, and now they're teachers, perhaps they forgot the experience, so it's always good to refresh that experience in their minds. Okay, so the next one is self-management, the ability to manage one's emotions. And this goes back to like self-regulation that we were talking about, uh, thoughts and behaviors effectively in different situations and to achieve goals and aspirations. Managing one's emotions is very, very important. And we have to, to be able to manage our emotions, we have to first understand um, self-awareness, which is the first one. We have to understand what we're feeling. And um, I realized when I was teaching my students that many times when, when we say emotions, just, you know, mentioning emotions in, in, in the language classroom and we're writing about it and they don't really know what that stands for, like grief, anxiety, 
um, like, what is that? Yes, they know the word, but what does it look like? How does it feel like for them, right? Understand that first, so they, they're able to self-regulate in your classroom. Um, those are the conversations that you can have with students. You're still using language. You're still using, um, you know, um, focusing on second language acquisition. It's just the perspective of how you're teaching language and on emotions and well-being and regulation, self-regulation, social awareness, the ability to understand the perspectives of and empathize with others. Empathy is very, very important, taking others' perspectives. So what activities, for example, are you implementing in your classroom that gives students the opportunity to take others' perspectives. And what I started doing is I started, depending on the level that you're teaching, of course, but what we what we started doing was activities. Um, I would divide the class into groups, for example, and then I would bring maybe like a one or two paragraph um, vignette, a, a short story of one to two paragraphs, you know, a situation, an event. And uh, again, it depends on the level that you're teaching. You might have to change a little bit the, the strategy there, the activity. But um, they would read about the, the, the activity, the event, something that happened. And, you know, for example, um, this person um, experienced this and he or she did this. Is that person reacted to the event? They're, they're using critical thinking. They're working in group. And then they're talking about, they're putting themselves in somebody else's shoes. They're taking their perspective, you know, and then they would say, well, I agree with this person's uh, decision or, or choice because or no. And, you know, they're argumenting their, their point of view, but other person's uh, perspectives, they're putting themselves in someone else's shoes and they're looking at, uh, you know, different situations. They also start learning from what they will have different ideas. Um, we started doing, when I was teaching uh, ninth graders, uh, I started um, doing a lot of reading about emotion. I remember very much, um, we had wonderful conversations, one of them being that uh, we talked about honesty and what is honesty. And then, um, you know, we hear something that happened and then st the, stu the students starting to share perspectives on like, oh, honesty this is what honesty is and um, it's important to be honest but then I had a student who said you know what Mr. Penton uh, I don't think honest because for example where I come from in in that particular country if you're honest the government takes everything from you and you and your family cannot eat so you have to do things that are considered not honest by the government to survive that, you know, that created, of course, some dialogue there. And uh, I'm not saying it's incorrect or correct. I'm just different perspectives. And then uh, someone said, for example, then honesty, it depends on. So they start looking at moral values, emotions, all of these things from different layers. So and, and the conversation was so rich. Um, it was very interesting, very interesting. But let me continue here because I do have some activities that I want to get through. Um, and uh, Amanula, please let me know if I'm going a little bit over the time. I'm, uh, sometimes I just go over the time, updated on the time. The next one, relationship skills, the ability to establish and maintain healthy and supportive relationships and to effectively navigate settings with diverse individuals and groups. And, you know, group work, teamwork, Make sure resolving conflicts. This this is something else that you could do. Um, we started. We had a lot of uh, conflicts, and, and I guess it happens, especially in K through twelve. You have a lot of conflicts, and um, how do you respond to conflicts? Uh, resisting, for example, one of the bullet points: resisting negative social pressure, peer pressure. So we talked a lot about peer pressure. What is peer pressure? How do you respond to peer pressure? Things like that. It's very important to do that also in the classroom. Again, depending on the population that you're teaching. And last but not least, uh, responsible decision making. And the way that I used to introduce responsible decision making to my students is uh, do the right thing when no one is watching, right? So um, make sure that it, this also includes of making sure that they're good individuals and, and that they're doing the right thing in their community, even when no one is watching, okay? So um, that's kind of like the best way that I can describe um, responsible decision making. But um, it's very important that we keep in mind that this is just uh, castles. 
um, social emotional framework, there are practices, um, there are other, um, other ways that scholars, teachers have been approaching social one of the most uh, well-known, but there are different representations. It's very important to know that social emotional learning is not a program, it's not set in stone. Activities, approaches um, that can use in their setting. It's, it should not be something that is prescribed for everyone the same. That's not how it works because contexts change. Population of populations of students change, okay? Um, okay, so some examples here, story circles. There was actually a book uh, recently published and I by Rutledge about story circles and how they use it in language classrooms. Mindfulness is a wonderful uh, initiative that a lot of schools are learning, positive psychology. Again, the work of uh, Tommy Gregerson, Sarah Mercer, check it out. Nature, do some work with nature journaling. Um, if you're not familiar with it, just as it comes out, I'll be glad to share it with you. But um, involving nature or, or uh, being more, more uh, surrounded by nature and language learning uh, is doing um, you know, great results, results with our students. Uh, restorative practices, and this is something that I do, do with my high school students. I used to do articles that I can share with you. And uh, we talked a lot about emotions, well-being. Um, yoga is another initiative, peace education. Uh, check out the work of uh, Rebecca Oxford. Uh, she does wonderful work with peace education. Uh, and more of work out there and bibliotherapy, that's something that I've become very interested about with um, how to, to incorporate social emotional learning through bibliotherapy. And I'm going to share with you what it is just in a And um, some people uh, might ask, and, and they're, you know, like, why? Why social emotional learning? language teaching or second language teaching in general, right? Well, um, I found these two things, uh, one from Castle, but then the other one from, um, it was in, in social media. And I said, okay, because it makes perfect sense. Um, if a child can do advanced math, speak three languages, or receive, not manage their emotions, practice conflict resolution, or handle stress, none really going to matter and think about that as human beings you know uh, do everything top top notch right you can you can speak through languages do all of these great things but you cannot handle stress you you're you're continuously getting into conflict because you cannot practice conflict risk emotions everything makes you stress anxious then the other things really don't matter because um you're you're always dealing with other things Found very profound. Also, uh, another thing that I saw here in Castle's website, SE, SEL, social emotional learning, is the necessary foundation that academic learning is built upon or built on. Um, that speaks a lot to my experience when I was teaching elementary, middle, and high school. And um, as teachers, in adult education might be a little bit different in my experience, but when I was teaching K through 12, it's really hard to teach if students, how they're behaving, one, but then also how to self-regulate their behavior. And um, many, many times as a, as a novice teacher, for example, as a new teacher, I spend over 50% of my classes just kind of trying to manage behavior issues in the classroom. I don't know if uh, um, some of you may have had that experiences in elementary, middle, and high school. So, you know, if you try just to teach academics, academics like speaking, listening, reading, writing, okay, that's okay. But if emotions and, and behavior is not involved there, it's just, it's just going to be very, very difficult for you to be able to do it. Again, in my experience and what I experienced in my, taking that approach of social foundation, and then you, you can continue to teach academics through social emotional learning. So you're working both simultaneously. Okay, so like I shared, I do have some examples here that I would like to share with you. And again, you can find these in the articles. Email me, please, at any time. Okay, and I'll be glad to share this with you. Um, let me, uh, we have 
Thank you very much. Making students aware of what they're doing and the strategies they're following is crucial as well. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Yes. And, and that's that awareness, going back to Castle's framework, self-awareness is very important. Self-awareness, self-regulation. Many times students, especially my elementary students, they didn't realize that they were speaking very, very loudly, Mr. Penton, and they would be like yelling out loud. Uh, you know, kind of becoming annoyed or upset because they, they still didn't understand this thing. So it, it's important. And look, perhaps the volume is a little bit too high. Do you see how that's affecting other students? And trust me, the, even elementary students understand these things. Just talk to them and they, they understand. They understand. Thank you. Uh, so let's continue here with the uh, um, bibliotherapy. And this is one of the, the strategies, social emotional learning strategies. I started using in my classroom and I continue to use very much even in teacher preparation programs. It changes, of course, by set. It's bibliotherapy nonetheless. So the bibliotherapy, if you're not familiar, is the use of literature to promote mental health. Now, when we think about literature, we're not talking about only like Shakespeare and, and um, Cervantes de Saavedra and all of this, you know, literature and bibliotherapy where we're thinking about every text, every, every um, written text, okay? And I've also seen bibliotherapy with actually with visuals uh, as well, uh, like pictures and things like that, where, where uh, students can read the image in a sense, like they can describe what's happening in the image, okay? But again, in this definition, the word literature is used in the broadest possible sense to include diverse forms of reading and writing. And um, in ESO 1, newcomers, they call it, which is, first uh, class of English and in ninth grade, um, what we call the feelings board. And one of the walls in the classroom became the feelings board. And uh, what we would do is that we started, I, I started incorporating a lot of poems, poetry in um, that uh, poetry. And I found that to be very cathartic for my students, very helpful for my students in level one because they could play with the words, they could play with um, the vocabulary that they were learning. And uh, we, uh, feelings, you know, so we would do poems and then I would ask my students to use um, creative. And, and that's very important, Create creativity in, in language, second language learning is also very, very important, especially when everything is so structured, right? So, um, I would tell them, okay, choose an emotion and uh, something that you're feeling and then write a poem about it. And um, the poems, of course, I would teach them different types of poems. Like we see here some emotions like shyness, uh, uh, love, if you can see some of the, the cu cu curious, curiosity, uh, pride, um, hate, you know, you see some of the friendship trust so and they they could do whatever they wanted with it you know as long as they created the, the poem and you could see that they became very um i had some artists there in my classroom and um uh, i would usually use sing canes and haiku poems in our classroom and again for level one if you have more advanced students maybe you you might do something more advanced and that's perfectly fine you know, but he, listen here, uh, and you can see here as well, for example, you're still teaching nouns, you're still teaching adjectives, you're still teaching academic, you know, when people might think, okay, social emotional learning, you're not focusing on teaching language anymore. Oh, yes, I am. I'm teaching them all of this. But again, I'm, we're using this, and I'm embedding social emotional learning into it, okay? So um, for haiku poems, for example, we were talking about syllables and all of these things. All of these things you have to teach in advance, of course. Very cathartic experience for my students, and they were always very proud of everything they produced. The second one here, the second example activity that I have is mindfulness, which is the practice of slowing down, organizing our thoughts, and reacting to our surroundings. Well, keeping in mind the big picture. And um, the, really the, the goal of uh, mindfulness is to helping students just be in the moment and, and understand that there is an outside of the class and an inside of the class. And this might work very well with your students who perhaps outside of the classroom, life is very um, anxiety inducing, is full of stress. 
and then come into the classroom, they bring all of that with them. It's very difficult to focus when you're very, very stressed and, and you, your anxiety is through the roof, right? So it, it's a good opportunity to just relax, take five to 10 minutes to just become mindful and, and realize, okay, I'm, I'm separating everything that I brought from outside the classroom and I'm just situating myself here to learn. Trust me, it makes a difference. It, it's a great way to start classes and it, it's, it's a kind of a way to separate um, everything from outside the classroom and students can leave it at the door. It sets the pace for the rest of the class. And um, I have an example here, and this is actually a teacher that was featured in, in, the, in the book that I shared with you that I, I co-wrote with um, my friend and colleague, Hilda. And um, she was featured, uh, Kristen was featured, and, and she shared a, a, an activity of mindfulness that she uses in her elementary school. And uh, she does optimism, like every, every time she does uh, um, mindfulness activities, she includes uh, positive thoughts and positive um, ideas, right? And optimism was one of the ones that she shared with us. So um, this is the example here. I'll give you a second to read it while I drink some water. <laughs> One second. Okay, thank you. So as you can see here, she sets the scene, um, calming sounds or music, uh, dim the lights a little bit, or maybe leave the lights on, depending on, on whatever works for you. Okay, and then she asks students to think about optimism. Again, some of the students might not know what that means. You know, they hear words and they recognize the words, maybe they can translate it and everything, but do they know what it means? Do they know how it feels like? Okay, and then she, she starts uh, into the prompt of the second bullet point. Think about what optimism is to you. Think about, about a moment when you feel optimistic, as you close your eyes, picture yourself saying, I can do this, you know, and she's teaching them already about optimism. It's wonderful, wonderful activity there. Okay, so let's go here into the next one. And this is something that you can do. I've had uh, colleagues do this also as well with their uh, teachers. Actually, um, Hilda in the book, um, in our book, she talks about how she uses it with teacher preparation programs. And um, it works very well with her teachers as well, because many teachers, they come uh, to the class after they, they work, right? So in the afternoon, evening, they go to teacher preparation classes and they bring all of that stress, all of that anxiety. And then through mindfulness, she's able to separate that. Um, the last, last but not least here is piece that I have here to share with you. Uh, there are many more, but again, I just brought three uh, today. So peace education is the process of promoting the knowledge, skills, attitudes, and values needed to bring about behavior changes and to prevent conflict and violence. And um, really the primary education is to educate individuals on how to prevent conflict. That's the biggest thing, um, conflict resolution. And um, the way that I personally Peace. And, you know, I, I didn't introduce peace education. The concept might be a little bit abstract for second language learners, but the peace, what is peace? That's what I introduced. And this is an activity in the, um, the way that I started incorporating peace into the classroom and conflict resolution. Uh, for example, this is the first activity that you may choose to introduce. And if you're teaching other languages, please uh, translate this into the language that you're teaching. Very easy to do. So the word for peace in my native language is, they can write it down, peace feels like, and you might be really, um, you know, you might be surprised by the responses that you get from uh, students. Peace looks like, make a drawing, you know, ask students to draw. What does peace looks like in their mind for them? A peaceful memory I have is, they can write it. My definition of peace is, and, you know, um, this activity can really take um, very, very different ways that you can use this. Once you give uh, students the opportunity to um, do this activity, then they can start sharing with one another. You can find similarities in their definition of peace, uh, maybe differences in the definition of peace. What we started doing also, a big sign in our the um, major um, themes or major uh, things that were in 
peace. And that became our, became our definition of peace, of conflict resolution in the classroom. You know, for us, peace, to maintain peace in the classroom, we have to one, two, three, four, five. And uh, that was very helpful to them. It, they really liked that activity very much. And then we started, we continued to explore the, the, the topic of conflict and resolution through different activities. Um, I just wanted to end with this uh, before I invite questions. Uh, for me and my students, SEL was transformative. And I do believe that um, social emotional learning is transform transformative for every classroom, not only for languages, but also to become good human beings, proactive human beings, successful human beings. So um, I recommend it to all of you. Again, thank you. And uh, if you do have any questions, I'll be glad to share all of this with you. Please email me. That's my email right there. I'm going to also add it here in the chat box. Just give me one second. And um, now we have questions that you may have. Thank you all. Thank you so very much, uh, Dr. Luis Fenton. It was wonderful to hear from you, especially on uh, such a wonderful subject, uh, which we don't you know, often talk about emotions and uh, you know, learner psychology and uh, especially SEL. Thanks very much. We appreciate that. Now the floor is open for questions and answers. If you have any questions, please uh, put them in the chat. And uh, while some of the questions were submitted to me earlier, this is from Katie Archer from US and she says, how do you see social emotional learning extending into a higher education in historically traumatized indigenous uh, peoples? Manula, I think we had a delay there. Can you please repeat? I'm so sorry. Yeah, so Katie asks, how do you see social emotional learning extending into higher education in historically uh, traumatized indigenous people? Amanula, I'm, I'm very sorry. I think you froze. Uh, could you please write it here in the chat box? I'm, I'm very sorry. I don't know if it's my internet. I don't know what's happening, but uh, you froze. Uh, chat box or can the person write in the chat box okay. the question okay uh, so yeah sure uh, yes mm -hmm. sure mm. yeah uh, you can pick up the questions from chat and while i'll you know try to write it in the chat yes please uh write box and i think we do have some delay so i uh, your question um uh, a little bit um and let me let me uh, go back to slide because i know some of you are asking for uh the previous slide so um higher education i think the work of social emotional learning in higher education must uh start with teachers and in teacher preparation programs because we're, we have to educate the newer generation of teachers into the, the not only the, the benefits of social emotional learning but the promise of social emotional learning how social emotional learning language classrooms and just classrooms in general. Again, I'm, I'm looking at second language acquisition here because that's my, in any classroom, social emotional learning can be found. So I think it, it must um, begin with not only uh, teacher preparation programs, but also we have to, um, and we tend to put a lot of things on things of, of, on teachers, like teachers have to do this, teachers have to do that. Yes. But beyond that, we also have to start having conversations with administrators and stakeholders and people in high positions and letting them know, look, this is what we need. And um, that circles into the circles into the work that Sarah Mercer is doing on, on well-being, teacher well-being and student well-being. Social emotional learning is about focusing on positive experiences on, on, on students and teachers' well-being, realizing that the classroom. It's, it's just another space of our life, right? So we have to be well and, and experience wellness in the classroom and beyond because that's going to connect, okay? So it's very, very important to do. 
let me see here. I have a few questions. I found your research interests include problem-based service learning. Could you please let me know what kind of model or procedure do you use in applying problem-based service learning in second language learning? Absolutely. Yonggu, uh, Yonggu, uh, please. Uh, it's, it's a little bit of a different conversation. I'll be glad to, uh, you know, it's actually, I, I would spend a whole conversation talking about problem-based service learning, but I'll be glad to share with you all the resources that I have, there's actually, just to give you a quick overview, uh, there is a, a new art, uh, chapter coming out on how we uh, incorporate social and emotional or problem-based service learning, of course, including social emotional learning there with students who have interrupted schooling. And uh, we present a seven step procedure. Uh, so please email me as soon as it's out, it should be out um, next month, February. I'll be glad to share with you. It has a very detailed step-by-step -step process, but that might take a whole other presentation. So, uh, you know, please email me, email me. Um, thank you. Uh, what for students who find English learning is because they perceive English as a tool to pass the exam. Yes, happiness, though subjective in nature, is thought to have behind it. Um, yes, so it, it's it's very important. It's it, understand um, the emotions and again the experiences that students bring with them when they think about language and um, I, I the reality in our school systems that the language everything is so standardized now that everything tends to focus on standardized testing the best um, um, mark thank you for that question the best example that I can give or the best suggestion that I can give is to bring as much uh, social components or social interactions as possible. So students, not only for testing, but languages to communicate, languages to make connections, languages to human beings. And, um, you know, the way that I started doing that as well is through like um, exploring, for example, we started exploring idioms in the classroom or started exploring words that um, were, were different, you know, in other languages that um, they just have different meanings. Every language has different, uh, tech, when we think of, of our memories embedded in the language, right? So phrases and, and, and uh, specific languages, they, they have knowledge. So if we teach that to students, it might be just like in the beginning of each class, starting with something, an interesting fact or an interesting uh, idiom about the language, English, for example, so they can see how um, that's different um, or how they can connect the language that they're learning beyond the school, because it happens in schools a lot that the teaching tends to focus on passing exams, on standardized testing, and that really narrows down the, the reality of what languages are for. And again, students are not a fault, teachers are not a fault, it's higher ups. The way that they have conceptualized language learning in, in K through 12 and, and just in standardized um, testing, it's not helpful. But my information uh, helps a little bit. Um, let me go here. How do you see SEL in higher education? Yes, I, I shared that. And historically traumatized indigenous peoples. And that's a, a different uh, conversation there to have. Um, there, there are a lot of work with trauma-informed practices right now, but for indigenous peoples, it's a little bit different. Uh, when we think about uh, trauma from, from the indigenous purview, one of my, my passions, my, my research areas is indigenous populations, indigenous studies. So that's definitely a, a, a different conversation to have. It's not, there isn't a simple answer to that. Again, trauma-informed practices are out there, but for indigenous people it's different. Also, when we think about social emotional learning, specifically from the purview of indigenous peoples, social emotional learning tends to focus on uh, classroom activities, but in reality, uh, social emotional learning happens everywhere in life. So that's also something to consider. Uh, maybe, you know, and, and I've seen this in some um, publications from indigenous scholars that they're pushing back a little bit on the idea of social emotional learning and how um, perhaps it's like Western perspective of, of learning, but in, in their, their lives or in just in general lives, we do social emotional learning every day. So it doesn't have to be confined to the classroom. Again, sorry, I don't have a, a like one sentence answer for that question. It's, it's very, um, it requires a lot of dialogue, but I hope what I share about higher education helps a little bit. It's enabling uh, 
Next question. Is enabling learners um, have ownership of learning or enabling learners own their experiences develop social emotion? Khaled, I, I don't think I understand that question. If you can uh, um, please re, uh, revise that question there. I'm, I'm, I'm having trouble understanding that one. Uh, Mark, thank you for that question. I'm thinking you're talking here about um, enabling learners have ownership of learning and relevant to their experience. Yeah, I'm sorry, Halid, I'm not understanding that question. Okay, and I think, Amanul, I think those are all the questions that I'm seeing here. If you do have any other questions or need any other uh, resources from me, uh, please do email me at any time. I'll be glad to um, communicate with you via email. That's my email right there in the chat box. Thank you all for your kind comments here. I'm glad it's helpful. Thank you so very much, uh, Dr. Lewis, uh, for this wonderful presentation. I really appreciate your time and expertise. And thanks for taking all these wonderful questions and comments. So many of the appreciation for your session in the chat box. So it really was useful. I thank you all the participants uh, for this, in, uh, for your participation and uh, for your contribution and sharing the resources and wealth of this knowledge in the chat box. So yeah, for our future webinars, you can follow us on our social media channels. We are available on Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook page. And for this recording for Dr. Lewis session, this recording will be available on our teacher development webinars, the YouTube channel. If you want to obtain a certificate, you can email at info.tdwebinars at the rate of gmail.com. In the month of February, we will be announcing International Mother Language Day webinar series. So please, uh, you know, be, you know, uh, keep your finger crossed for that. So until that, I'll join you in the next webinar. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Luis Javier, once again. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day.